it was generally a giant pain to do that. You'd have to use like some form of like a pseudo selector, like in a child, and then add padding to the middle item. And then once you start more responsive, then you have to overwrite that in the child selector, and it gets to be a little bit annoying. So um, yeah, granular control is not something the box model necessarily excels at. Um, row control is really not something that you get with uh, with floats and uh, the box model in general. It's a little bit more difficult, and then obviously vertically centering things is not easy at all. So now moving even further into the future, we talk about Flexbox just a little bit. Um, Flexbox is the only layout method that was actually designed for the responsive web. So uh, Flexbox is awesome. If you're going to use Flexbox, definitely keep using Flexbox. Um, Flexbox is great for giving you more granular control kind of over how those items uh, within it behave. And you get a little bit more uh, control over columns and rows with, uh, with things like flex direction. Uh, so that's super helpful. In addition to that, you can like, row, shrink, order, justify, align flex items, uh, like with justify content space between. You can get that nice even spacing between multiple divs, uh, which is lovely. Vertically centering things, if this huge epiphany when this happened, we're all super happy. You can align items to center, and things will be centered vertically. Um, super helpful stuff there. Flexbox is really, really good uh, for, for smaller components, kind of like the layouts within a layout, that type of stuff. Uh, so if you think of things along the lines of like navigation items and, and just generally like components within um, various pieces of your layout, that's where Flexbox definitely shines. You do a lot of stuff in Flexbox. Flexbox is not uh, without its shortcomings, that's for sure. Um, Flexbox isn't necessarily ideal for full page layouts. Uh, this article by Jake Archibald goes into really, really good detail about why you shouldn't use Flexbox for page layout. Um, if you get a chance to read that, that's a super good article. Intel Grid, however, it, I mean, Flexbox worked a lot better than the alternatives we had, um, that's for sure. Um, but part of the problem, I think, is we maybe overuse it a little bit, especially when it came to using Flexbox for, for layout. So one of the things in that article that uh, Jake Archibald talks about a little bit is why Flexbox isn't necessarily the best on slow connections. Uh, Flexbox has a tendency to kind of shift around on page load, um, especially on slow connections. It becomes painfully obvious on slow connections. And for a variety of reasons, content shifting around during page load is, is super annoying, especially for those folks on slower connections. Uh, this little video here kind of shows exactly why that can be an issue. Um, this is an annoying video, so don't worry, there's no sound. Uh, but as you can see, kind of Flexbox on the left-hand side there takes up the whole width of the uh, container. Keep playing that. So it takes up the whole width of the container. The user on a slower connection is going to start trying to read, consume that article, you know, because the article's long, let's get a head start on it. But as various pieces start coming into play and the DOM actually loads them, you'll see that the content ends up shifting around. So a user on a slower connection who started reading that article will likely lose their place because the content's shifted and they're not able to read uh, or not able to see where they were exactly. The, the reason that this happens uh, with Flexbox, the, the algorithm that Flexbox uses, it Flex items within a Flexbox container are told kind of how to interact with each other, right? So there's a flex item, uh, for example, like this big block of content here. If this has a flex basis of one and the rest of the items further down in the DOM haven't loaded quite yet, it's going to take up the entire space uh, because the algorithm behind it hasn't seen any of the flex items come to play yet, and um, that's just how it's supposed to behave. So as soon as another flex item comes uh, down through the DOM, it recognizes that the flex basis shifts, uh, the algorithm uh, kind of shifts the items on the DOM down. Super annoying if you're on a slow connection. But as you can see on the right hand side of the grid, the content loads at a relatively fixed width. 
and then uh, the surrounding grid items as they're loaded just kind of pop right into place. There's no content shifting there. So I think it's important to kind of understand uh, where we came from and stuff and understand too that there are definitely some really valid use cases for uh, you know, tables only good for capturing data, so just use that for tables. But like uh, Flexbox and the box model certainly do still have their uses, so don't discount them completely. Uh, just because we don't want to fall into the same trap of Flexbox and you know, overuse grid. So now we can kind of get on to the good stuff. This is like my favorite GIF of all time. It's pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, now we can actually start talking a little bit about grid stuff. There's going to be a good amount of like phone examples and stuff, and um, we'll run through that. And first, first thing I want to do is kind of just start us off with a little bit of terminology that's used, um, you know, pretty much in every blog post tutorial, that type of thing. So this uh, code pen demo that I built here is just like a, a relatively simple uh, visualization of some of the terms associated with a, uh, a grid layout. So I'll just kind of poke through these here. Uh, so the first term here is a grid line. You can see, hopefully you can see that highlight there. Um, first thing is a grid line. Uh, the dividing lines that make up the structure, uh, the grid lines are the dividing lines that make up the structure of a grid layout. They can be horizontal or vertical. Um, you can see here every single one of these lines within here constitutes a grid line. Similarly, grid tracks can also be uh, horizontal or vertical. You can call them like rows or columns if that's easier as well. But a grid track is just the space between two adjacent grid lines. Um, you can see here. Um, so as long as the space between uh, two adjacent grid lines that, that's a grid track. Next up is a grid cell. Uh, interchangeable term with that grid item. I usually say grid item, so here we say grid item. That's also a grid cell. I mean the same thing. Uh, a grid item is just the space between two adjacent uh, horizontal and two adjacent vertical grid lines. So relatively straightforward. One of these boxes is a grid item. And then lastly, a grid area is just the total space surrounded by any four grid lines. Um, they don't necessarily have to be adjacent. Um, but a grid area can contain any number of grid items. So if we encompass like three and seven, that would still be considered one grid area. Relatively basic terms, uh, but I'll be using these throughout. So yeah, that makes sense. So with grid, we get something ridiculous like 13 or 14 new properties. So there's a lot to digest. Um, we're not going to go through all 13 or 14 of them to be here for like four hours, but I'm going to try and give you some good, at least starting points where you can start playing around with grid and start using it in, the, in production sites. But before we do anything, we have to define a grid, and we do that with the, uh, the, the display property. So with the display property, we get a few new values. If you've ever used Flexbox before, these should look relatively similar, except for the last one. Um, Grid just outputs a block level grid element. Inline grid does the same with an inline level element. Subgrid is where stuff it starts to get a little funky. You don't have to worry about it too much because it's not in the current implementation of CSS grid. It's been moved to like level two of the spec. Uh, but essentially what subgrid does is if you've defined a grid and you have a grid item within that grid that you also want to be a grid, you can define it as a subgrid. And what it's going to do is it's just going to inherit the uh, row and column definitions that you've given to the parent and use them in the, in the child element. So it gets a little weird. You can have like grids inside of grids inside of grids, which starts to get a little confusing. But um, yeah, something to keep in mind uh, for sure as the spec progresses. All right, so here's, here's our first little uh, code snippet. Wait, you can see that, OK? OK, good. Cool. So, um, like I mentioned, uh, the very first thing that we need to do is define the grid. So um, in this little code pen example here, I just have some basic HTML with a grid container and then four grid items within it. Uh, much like Flexbox, pretty much like all of the controls that you want for your uh, grid end up in place on the actual parents and not the individual items. There are some 
uh, properties that you can apply to uh, individual grid items, but we won't go into that quite yet. So the, the value here for grid template columns might look a little weird, but um, by, by applying grid template columns or grid template rows uh, to the wrapper, we can essentially define a template, right, for how we want our grid to behave and how we kind of want to lay out our grid. So we can break this snippet down a little bit. Those, um, those terms in the brackets are considered line names. So with grid, you actually get the ability to name individual grid lines within your grid. It's an arbitrary and optional value. You definitely don't have to use that. It's not required for grid template columns to work. Um, but it does make things a little bit easier for you down the road for like, organizational purposes or if you just want really cool like Tron grid names. That's, that's a good idea always. Um, by default, grid template columns will um, it, it will apply line names to each of the grid items or each of the grid lines by default, and it's just numbers, so one, two, three, four, um, however many uh, columns you end up defining. That's the default value. The grid just does that inherently. Uh, the pixel values that you see there, those are track sizes, so those, that's actually like where most of the magic happens, right? That's where we are defining the actual width of the columns within our grid. So you can see here in this little example, first two grid items are the same size of the pixels, the next one's twice as big, and the third one is just 150 pixels, just for whatever reason. But yeah, so um, with grid template columns, we essentially just define however many uh, grid items we have within this container, we can define their sizes just by one after the other, um, giving them some sort of value. Now there's various values that we can use here. It doesn't necessarily just have to be pixels. You can also use percentages, viewport um, width, uh, that type of thing, and it's whatever you want to use. Um, but with grid, we do get a new, um, a new unit. It's called the FR unit. And the FR unit represents a fraction of the available space within a grid container. Uh, I think I think the like abbreviation for it is just fractional unit. Um, so taking our previous code snippet, instead of giving each one of those uh, columns a fixed pixel value, uh, we're using one FR here, and more or less what that's going to do is just give us four equally sized uh, columns based on the width of the, of the grid container. So you can see here in the example, it's exactly what happens. The, uh, the algorithm behind this kind of just detects how many grid items you've defined uh, through the HTML and um, proportionately sizes those divs based on uh, the percentage of the whole. So yeah, pretty nifty little uh, unit there. Kind of makes it nice and easy for us to get equally sized divs. Sorry. Am I? Yeah. Are you doing questions for Al? Sure, go for it. How is that different from percentage? Is this someone who doesn't use CSS very much? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So I, I think what um, what the FR unit does, you can you can set like um, like one FR, two FR, and have it be fractionally proportionate to the um, to the grid as a whole. You can do that with percentages too. I mean, it's more or less the same thing. But what ends up happening, I think, is that like the algorithm kind of trying to just detects how big it should be. Yeah? But the difference is that the fraction is the remaining space, whereas the percentage would be a total space. There you go. Right. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah? Yeah, thanks. Sure. So can you introduce the maximum values for a particular Yeah, absolutely. That's actually a, a property that I'll go over here in just a sec, for sure. Um, but before we move on to that, too, it, uh, it might be super annoying to uh, type out each one of those values individually. It gets a little bit long, especially for whatever reason you have like a 10 column for it. Um, that would be really annoying to like write one FR 10 times. Um, so there's a, a, a nifty little um, notation here called the repeat notation. Right, so the repeat notation, instead of having to uh, individually define each one of those grid template columns, we can um, 
tilde repeat notation that, hey, we have four graded items, and I want each one of those four to be one fractional unit uh, wide. So reduces the amount of typing, makes it a little bit more convenient. Uh, yeah. Mind blown, super convenient, that's awesome. So now getting a little bit more uh, specific, like I said, grid gives you the ability to have like a ton of um, granular control over the items within it, uh, so much so that you can more or less reorder the um, appearance of the elements within the DOM, so visually um, will so yeah, visually you can, you can re, reorder the um, grid items that you've defined. So if you can see here, this is more or less our uh, previous example. I've reduced it down to three columns just for simplicity's sake, and then I've also added grid template rows. I've given those rows arbitrary names. Again, you don't have to put those in there, but just for example's sake, there they are. I made this little like weird ASCII art thing just to kind of help visualize how uh, the, the grid line names end up working. So one thing to keep in mind too is that grid automatically kind of defines its start and end. So those are keyword like values that you can use um, within here as well. And the properties that we're going to be talking about too. So, so grid column start, grid column end, grid row start, and grid row end um, are all new new properties that we can use. And those are what actually ends up defining how we position our grid items within our grid. So you see with the first grid item here, I've, I've told it to start at the uh, grid line named Flynn. So by default, you know, these grid items should fall into the order that they appear within the DOM. So the first grid item would generally show up here, starting at the, the very first grid line, which is Rensler, and, and going from there. But I explicitly told the first grid item to not do that, start at Flynn, and end at the end of the, uh, end of the grid. So that's, like I said, one of those keywords that you can use there. Similar thing for grid row start and grid row end. I just told it to start at the very beginning and end at Tron, so it's going to span the, the, those first uh, two columns there. Grid item number two, I've given it a little bit less information. I haven't told it where to start because by default it's going to start at the very beginning. So this second grid uh, column is going to start at the very beginning and go over to Flynn. Same deal with row start. I've told it to start at Kevin and go all the way through the uh, third row here to the very end. Grid item three, by well, now I'm sure you're going to take a picture of the grid item three. If you need less information, um, it knows where to end based on um, just kind of the way that it works in the back end there. And the very last one I've given, like almost nothing, I've just told it where to start. And I want it to start at the second grid uh, line here. So you can see, you know, So as you can see here, I've, I've, I've moved the uh, elements within the DOM more or less, right? So we've reordered grid item 1 so that it appears next to grid item 2, and then same thing with grid item 4, so it's not the very last thing. Um, yeah, just all through the use of um, uh, grid start, uh, grid column start, and grid column int stuff. So yeah, pretty nifty. Um, really cool, easy way without JavaScript to kind of move elements on the top around reordering that type of stuff. One thing obviously to keep in mind when you are reordering things is like make sure that your content within grid item four isn't dependent on grid item three so that visually the content doesn't make any sense. But yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. A uh, whole bunch of grid uh, properties there for sure. So now is where we'll get into that min-max kind of notation we were talking about. Um, min-max defines a size range greater than or equal to the minimum value that we pass it and less than or equal to the maximum value that we pass it. So in this little demo here, if we scroll down. So in addition to the min-max function, I'm also using the repeat notation just for a little bit shorthand here. Um, but what we're saying here is, hey, I have four grid items and I want them to never be lower, never, never get smaller than 200 pixels wide. So, I'll just open actually, you can kind of see that in action. So you won't be able to see it in action because the screen is too small. There we go. So as I kind of size this stuff down, 
the min-max uh, property here tells the grid items that, hey, you're never supposed to get smaller than 200 pixels. Um, once they do, they just stop shrinking, and you'll notice that a terrible, horrible horizontal scroll bar shows up here, um, but that's something we could fix. Uh, but yeah, and as you scroll up, you'll notice that the, the one FR kind of kicks in and um, equally sizes these four items uh, proportionately, how you'd expect. So min-max, super useful. Um, yeah, it helps kind of give us like a little bit of a, a fluid uh, layout here without, without too much extra work or media queries. So let's fix that horizontal uh, scroll bar. So likely you probably want your grid to automatically kick grid items down to a new row once they do shrink uh, to, that, to that minimum value that you've defined. Um, through this little example here, instead of defining uh, a fixed number of grid Items within the repeat notation, um, the auto placement algorithm is another uh, piece of grid, and through through the auto fill value, we can kind of adjust how that uh, algorithm behaves a little bit. So um, instead, like I said, instead of defining a fixed number of grid items per column, we pass the auto fill uh, value to to the repeat notation, and Essentially, the, the grid will take however many children are within your grid container and have them fill up the, the appropriate amount of space. And then again, in addition, through, through like the use of, of min-max, it's going to maintain that same kind of example that we had previously where nothing's going to get smaller than 200 pixels. And as soon as it does get smaller than 200 pixels, it's going to kick the grid item down onto a new row. So as you can see here, without any media queries at all, we get like a responsive responsive design, more or less, without, uh, without too much extra effort. As you can kind of see here, too, as it as it gets bigger, it, the, the algorithm kind of notices that there's enough space for an at least 200 pixel wide grid item here, so it is going to uh, add that little extra space there. It's just something to kind of keep in mind if you're going through. But yeah, super fancy. That's super exciting. Um, I like that a lot. So kind of to dive a little bit deeper into auto placement too, where um, the auto placement algorithm ensures that each grid item has just a grid area to go into. So the algorithm for sitting there making sure that each one of your grid items has somewhere to go. Um, we're able to control the behavior of this algorithm even further than in the, the autofill example uh, by way of the grid autoflow property. Now by default, when you define a grid, the grid autoflow property is set to sparse. And what sparse ends up looking like, if you have a ridiculous grid like this one that I built out here, you'll kind of notice that the, uh, I've, I've told grid items 7 and 9 to be taller and wider than the rest of the grid items here. And because of that, uh, grid item 9 has dropped down to a new row and left <coughs> space right here, same deal with uh, grid item 7, it's left in empty space right here. Um, what the sparse value does is it ensures that the grid items have, or ma maintain some sort of order, some sort of basic order. So like, as your, you know, you're looking at reading little bits of content, whatever um, is housed within these grid, uh, grid items, the flow still maintains some sort of order. So you can see Grid item 10 drops down here after uh, grid item 9, and it maintains some sort of logical um, order. <coughs> Another uh, value that we can use with grid autoflow is, is the dense value, uh, where it differentiates from, from sparse is that it doesn't care about order. It's just going to uh, ensure that the grid items don't overlap. That's its only, its only concern. Oops. So you can see here with that same example, using grid autoflow dense, instead of leaving this weird little gap here, grid item 10 has been pulled up into where the uh, where grid item 9 left the hole, and then the, the rest of the grid is kind of shifted accordingly uh, to Ooh.
So yeah, this um, grid autoflow dense gives us a lot of a really cool opportunity to be able to uh, develop out like the masonry style uh, layout that designers like to, to challenge us with and make us frustrated when we have to use like a JavaScript framework to, uh, to achieve that. With grid, um, super, super easy to accomplish that type of masonry layout with the grid autoflow dense property. So I'm sure throughout this whole thing, just like any other like brand new CSS uh, property deal, you're probably concerned about browser support, understandably so. Crazily enough, like CSS Grid gained pretty wide browser support pretty darn quickly. Um, the current version of it, so I cut off the browser names, which is annoying, but Chrome, Firefox, Safari, all major browsers uh, have full support of the current uh, implementation of CSS Grid, IE 11 naturally and Edge 15 use an older version of the syntax, uh, which you can kind of get around with uh, some awesome, awesome fallbacks. And even if you have to support like older browsers like I 9 for some, some terrible reason, I'm so sorry that you have to do that. Um, but if you, if you do have to do that, um, Rachel Andrew, who's like the, the champion of CSS Grid for sure has uh, an awesome like cheat sheet for fallbacks. Um, a few of them use like at supports queries, which are super helpful. So it kind of detects whether or not the current browser uh, supports uh, grid, and then you can write some fallbacks within there. And then if if the browser that you're in doesn't support at supports, then it's just going to ignore um, that altogether. So you can hire up in the cascade. You can define some other more sensible like box model float uh, uh, fallbacks if you like. But yeah, definitely I'll, I'll tweet out the link to these slides or you can just grab it from there too um, so that everyone has these awesome links. But yeah, Rachel Andrew, follow her. She's awesome. She knows everything about her. And just some more uh, resources. Like I said, those are like, uh, that's Rachel Andrews' Twitter. She tweets out about Grid all the time. And she's like actively working on various parts of the spec for Grid. So she'll tweet out like when something's changing. For example, like if you want space between your grids, there's a property called Grid Gap, which if you like use CSS columns, there's column gap. Uh, the property for that is actually changing. So right now it's called Grid Column Gap. That's the property name. But they're changing it to mimic what we're doing with uh, CSS columns and just changing it to um, column gap or grid gap or uh, sorry, row gap. Uh, so she tweets about that stuff. She has an awesome site called gridbyexample.com that has just a massive, massive amount of um, grid examples just from really basic stuff, more complicated things. She does an awesome job explaining them. There's videos that kind of show her going through them, uh, stuff like that. Another awesome person to follow, Jen, Jen Simmons. Uh, I think she's also kind of working on like the spec as well. They're, they're both incredibly, incredibly intelligent when it comes to uh, this type of stuff for sure. Uh, she has a, a labs URL at labs.jensimmons.com where she kind of puts up um, like cool layouts uh, that she's built with grid and like explanations of them. She blocks them out frequently as well. Um, she has this one, I'm gonna butcher the name, is like the Mondarian art on the, the thing where there's like a blue and a red and a yellow square with a bunch of black lines, a generator that uses CSS grids to actually create like random uh, Mondarian art. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then in addition to that, there's some MDN docs that are um, pretty fantastic, like walkthroughs of CSS grid layout, goes through all the 13 or 14 whatever properties that are, that are new with CSS grid. And then another really good resource is Chris House. He put together like a, a giant compendium of all of the CSS grid properties and values and has really good explanations of them. He doesn't go into some of like the auto placement algorithm stuff necessarily. It's kind of just more um, terminology, those types of properties. Um, for, for whatever reason, he just didn't go into those. And then last, if you've ever tried to learn like Flexbox and use Flexbox Froggy, like the game, awesome game to help you learn Flexbox. There's a, the CSS Grid version of it called CSS Grid Garden. Um, there's like there's like some weird negative values and stuff that you can use inside of like grid column start and things like that. Um, and CSS Grid Garden kind of shows you 
what those do and how uh, yeah, how to use CSS for it. So fun little game there. But that's it. That's me. Um, like I said, I'm Dom. You can follow me on Twitter, whatever, all that stuff. I tweet out shitty email things all the time. So hope you enjoy that. Uh, but yeah, I'll take any questions. I'll try to answer. But yeah. <laughs>